kind of other element like for instance carbon. Carbon also will end up giving you crystalline behavior as well as more. So it does depend on what material you are actually getting. Now I'm not interested in this. That means I'm not interested in the structure which looks ideal. What I'm interested in is I'm gonna <coughs> take away one of the atoms in this. Okay. Considering now what I have done is I have removed the periodicity in a specific direction. Right? What kind of periodicity I have removed? I have just taken away one lattice point and owing to this, this crystal structure is neither periodic in this direction nor in this direction. So I am just creating two dimensional restriction to the motion of any kind of charge carrier or any kind of a movable entity, whether it is phone or electrons, phone, that you will see a perturbation at a local level. Okay, and because of this, you will see a lot of properties are going to change. In this example, I am talking about creating a vacancy, which is a point effect. In the similar manner, you can have n number of defects. Like for instance, I think you might have already known about if you have a point effect, we consider it to be we consider it to be a zero dimensional defect as if you are creating a vacancy. But at the same time, if you increase the dimension of the uh, same um, uh, entity, that means instead of just removing an atom, you remove a line out of it. You know, as soon as you remove a line, we call this is like a line effect, or we call them as a dislocation. Also, in the similar manner, if you increase the dimension of the defects, that means now you combine two lines together. So you are creating a grain boundary about which inside the grain the material is different as compared to when you compare the same entity mm -hmm. outside. In terms of periodicity, you are only talking here in terms of periodicity. Now, so the question is: Is defect? We usually we want to be ideal, right? I said that we want to start with an ideal crystal because it is easy to understand. We can always explain the periodicity. We can explain what is the lattice vibration which are going to appear inside the system. But as soon as you introduce a defect into that particular system, is it good for that crystal? So the answer to that is, I'll just give you certain examples and then I will talk about that it is actually need not necessarily be a bad thing. Okay, like for instance, carbon to iron makes steel, right? Iron rust, but as soon as you add carbon to the bulk entity, I'm still into the bulk domain, I'm not into the nanoscale domain. It changes its property and it stops rusting. In the similar manner, when you add copper to nickel, it starts behaving like the thermocouple. Thermocouples we already use for sensing the temperature. So it is adding certain kind of applications to nickel, which otherwise earlier was not used. In the similar manner, germanium to silicon, turns out silicon to be a thermoelectric molecule. That means, now you can use germanium in a different proportion inside the silicon. You apply temperature difference, you generate electricity, right? And of course, other applications as well. Even grain boundaries are known to strengthen the property of the material, which earlier was used to be brittle. Actually, later turns out to be more of a ductile in nature. Okay, so these are like certain um, some examples. Okay, these are only like I would call them hardly 0.1% of the examples which at least can prove that it's not a bad thing. Okay, I'll come to more examples a little later. But for now, since I'm interested in nano, I think most of you know that we talk about something which lies between one nanometer to about 100 nanometer as a nanomaterial. But there are some arguments that even if you are just above, I mean just below the mesoscopic scale, that means about 10 to the power minus 6 meter, those materials are also considered as to be nanomaterials. But that depends on your deep Broglie wavelength and up till what limit you can confine the charge carriers inside the system. So that is why we consider anything which is below 10 to the power minus 6 to be of nanomaterial regime. For illustration, our nails, like I grew these many amount of the nails in one month, okay? So you can think of that the nail growth itself occur at 1 nanometer per second. So how many seconds in a month? Do you imagine that way the, the, the rate of the nail is being grown? Provided you just want to um, uh, think about what is the rate of the growth of all these entities in terms of a length scale, which we actually cannot visualize at every second or every minute. Anyway, these are certain other examples which I'm, um, I, I am very sure that you guys might be aware of. But what I'm interested now is, I'll start with the bulk material, like for instance, graphite, diamond, known allotropes of carbon. Okay? I'm sticking to carbon for now because some of the examples I'll be presenting in this presentation will also be of that of carbon. And of course, amorphous. These are bulk samples. You can see that. You can see a diamond crystal. You can see a graphite sample, pencil color. You can even see carbon suit up 
दिया जलाइए दिए के किनारे यू विल गेट दैट एमोस कार्बन का स्मोक ऑल दीज थिंग्स यू कैन विजुअलाइज बट देन वट आई डू इज आई टेक दिस डायमंड एंड आई स्टार्ट रिड्यूसिंग द साइज ऑफ दीज डायमंड Or what I do, I take this diamond and inside I create a defect. I'll talk about that defect also, which we call as an NB center inside the diamond. <clears throat> Or you take graphite, you start removing all the layers so that only one layer is being left. So what exactly we are doing? We are trying to miniaturize size of these entities <coughs> to a certain level so that either it ends up at an atomic scale <coughs> or even to the nanoscale. That means few atomic scales. So let's say, for instance, I have. Bucky balls like C60, C70, C82. Structure-wise, it looks like just a ball. In 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 parallel, I think there was a lecture just before me in that where um, uh, Professor Shivasan he was talking about quantum dots, carbon quantum nanomaterial, right? So these are like small small particulates which appear, uh, but they are all made up of carbon and to an extent also some hydrogen and oxygen conjugation inside. But what you see here is it's it's all all a periodic arrangement of Carbon sitting in a periodic manner inside this crystal structure, called crystalline, right? So you had diamond which was crystalline, you had graphite which was crystalline. Now you even have quantum dots, except the size of these dots are very, very small. Okay, of the order of about two nanometer in this particular. Then you can even extend this kind of confinement to let's say one dimension. What means that you talk about you talk about a tube which can be infinitely long in terms of length. But the radius associated with this tube—that means, if you take the cross section of this particular tube—that will be extremely small, of the order of few nanometer. If you calculate pi to pi r, it will be of the order of few hundreds of nanometer. So that means we are trying to include certain kind of restriction to the charge carriers which might move inside the lattice. And similarly, two dimension, which is one very good example, is graphene, and three dimensions where nano onions and uh, nano stars do appear. So this was just to give you an illustration that how. From carbon bulk sample, we can end up just getting carbon ka nano structure, different kind of nano structure, zero dimension, one dimension, two, and the three dimension nano structure. Okay, this is one example in which it's not carbon, but this is a cadmium selenide ka quantum dot, been adapted from somewhere else. But this I'm showing because you see the size of this is about two nanometer. The like diameter is roughly I'll call this as two nanometer. This looks like a perfect crystal, isn't it? But if you see something at the top, what you see is that there is a green boundary, or there is a line dislocation inside the crystal. All right. So the two crystals, which both are appearing in the same TEM image, are giving us two different kinds of behavior. Now imagine you <coughs> have perfect arrangement of lattices, which mostly do not exist. You know, nature loves symmetry, but nature never promotes idealism, right? Nature will never create a tree which will have both the sides similar. Nature will never create something. Even in the wings of butterflies, you will never have have identical behavior. Just like that, when you create these nano 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 uh, materials inside uh, the processes by either uh, wet chemical synthesis, <coughs> hydrochemical synthesis, and so on, these processes are trying to stabilize the particle. And stability is something what nature loves. And in this process, what you end up having is a structure which may have somewhere some kind of difference. All right. Perfectly, you will get hardly 0.1 percent. As I said, rest 99.9 percent will always have this kind of either dislocations or some kind of impurity within it. So the idea why I showed this is even at the nano scale, which is extremely small scale, you will see even by default you didn't want it to create it, but you ended up having a defect inside your system. And I'm very sure those who work on that materials must be already facing that these defects are kind of culprit in a lot of Uh, problems, but what I do here is I take this particle, okay, and I consider this particle as a box because my next slide is just like particle in a box. So what I do here is I take this particle and I say that there is one electron, one hole, any kind of particle, even a phonon, is only bound to move over this particle. That means I'm confining the motion of that single charge carrier over the particle itself. So now what happens? You think of that this zero to a becomes the particle size. This whole box becomes a free space for the electron to move, and beyond this, the particles are not allowed to move. That means it is giving an infinitely long potential so that it cannot leave the particle itself. What happens to this particle in a box is a very known standard uh, BSE ka problem. So you define wave function, you define Schrodinger wave equation, you even define that your wave vector turns out to be 
discrete in the number of number, which unlike for a free particle is a continuous. Right? And as soon as this discreteness appears in value of k, since it is nearly free electron approximation, that means your energy will still be h cut square k square over twice of m. Right? Except your k has now become discrete. So what happens because of that your energy begins to appear in terms of discrete numbers which earlier was a continuum. Now think of that, now initially <coughs> all energies were allowed but nanoparticle says no, you cannot actually use all those energies rather only discrete energies are being allowed. So on the basis of discrete energies and you know energies are responsible for every possible transition, transport inside the system. So your optical properties changes, your electrical properties changes, even any kind of magnetic properties which I'll be talking about are going to change. Similarly, <coughs> when you consider particle inside a two-dimensional box, particle inside a three-dimensional box, you begin to see different kinds of degeneracies and different kinds of states begin to populate inside the system. Now, I'll just, I'll, I'll just create an analogy of this particular system with respect to quantum well nanowires or even quantum wells. Quantum well is just like as if we are talking about a graphing sheet, right? And in this case, what we are doing, we are creating a confinement only in one direction. So this is a very good example of one-dimensional confinement or particle in one-dimensional box or having two degrees of freedom. When I say two degrees of freedom, that means particle is free to move in this direction, particle is free to move in this direction. But particle is not free to move in a direction. Similarly, for nanowires and quantum dots as well. In quantum dots, which I think I'll be discussing later as well, you actually see there is no degree of freedom. That means whatever charged particle you're going to create even on the quantum dot is going to be confined over the quantum dot. Now in order to make this particle move, you have to take these quantum dots and embed it into certain kind of matrices. That means you will be introducing these particles in special kind of matrix so that the property of the matrix changes because these quantum dots have some confined charge carriers over the surface. And this is one example of creating defects using quantum dots in a larger matrices, just like as I started with carbon inside iron. <coughs> okay, but what is the benefit of having all this? As I said, I just keep on talking about the energies. But energies are not energies when we talk about in solids. Energies are bands in solids, right? So if I talk about energy in bulk material, it's a band structure having conduction band and balance band, right? Continuum. You can see that even the density of the states are also in continuum as compared to where we define these energies. But as you start increasing the confinement, one-dimensional confinement, two-dimensional confinement, even three-dimensional confinement, what you're doing is you're actually introducing discreteness in the density of the states. That means now you are having a patch of density of the states which are going to have one energy. There is another patch of the density of the states which are going to have. That means what you're now doing is you're creating multiple bands within the same band, especially in a quantum well problem. As you go to more confinement, you will introduce discrete labels. Even if you increase it further, you will have just discrete labels for the transitions. Okay, so energy states changes, discreteness appears into the picture. So because of that, the property should change, right? That is exactly what I started with. So I will highlight few quantum properties because I'm only interested in those properties up here. So let's say for instance, I said I have created confined electron hole pairs inside the material, okay? What do we call uh, uh, bound pairs of electrons and holes, anyone? Excitons. Excitons, exactly. So we are creating bound pairs of electron and holes in a quantum material. Why we are, uh, quantum material means nanomaterial in this case, because length scale we are considering it to be confined. But what happens here is, because of the confinement effect, we are changing their energies, right? If you change the distance, that means if you bring electron and hole closer, if you take them away based on what is the binding energy you are creating on a given system, you will end up seeing that their excitations are going to change. That means energy level transitions are going to change. If excitations are changing, that means they are relating to the transition and hence the recombination rate associated with those particles will also be changing. In parallel, not just that, let's say for instance I am creating two spin states, okay? That means I create, I have a particle, it only has a single electron. And that electron has been facing spin up. Okay? Now, since this particle is so small, the spin is not going to interact with any kind of elastic or non in 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 inelastic interactions inside the system, right? Because charge carriers do not have free length to move inside the system. Because of that, what will happen? 
the relaxation and defacing process will be infinitely long. That means if the spin uh, stays like this, it will stay like this because it's not being going to relax because of certain kind of interactions or perturbations inside the system. And this is one very good example why people are working on nanosystems to create quantum bits for quantum information processing. Anyway, you can even tune the polarization. Spin is one example of polarization, but you can even talk about magnetic polarization. You start reducing the size of a magnetic domain to such that, that there is only a single domain going to exist. So that there is only one moment which is going to face in that way. We call super paramagnetic. I think I'll, I'll come to that particular example in a, in a while, but these are like certain properties associated with nanosystems. Okay, so these are a few more properties associated with nanosystems. These are like endless properties like you can add up in this. But, but I, I, as I said, I was more interested in these properties um, in, in general because these will be the one which I'll be talking in detail. Apart from, um, apart from talking about hardness, spin-spin capacity, mm -hmm. why, uh, conductivity, we work on conductivity, but I'm not going to talk about the conducting properties in this case because I'll not be discussing density of the states in this lecture. But what I'll be discussing here is the Curie temperature, which is the transition, the phase transition temperature which appears in this particular system. And in parallel, I'll be briefly talking about the catalytic activity where you can introduce a defect and that defect helps in tuning the uh, optical properties of a given system. And then I think this property has already been plotted somewhere. I think I have wrote the color variation in terms of the particle size. Perhaps my previous, the lecture, uh, he might have talked about how when you change the size of a particle, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, emission associated with that particle also changes. So these are like some examples of creating differently colored nanoparticles if you're <laughs> of, of that as well. There are a lot of ways of synthesizing nanomaterials, right? You already know, top down, bottom up, right? So <coughs> when we say top down, we take a bulk material, like I can start with graphite, mm -hmm. and I can end up getting one layer of graphite. Mm -hmm. This is a top down technique. I start with big, end up getting something small. Bottom up, I start with atoms. I'm interested in atoms first, and I'll allow these atoms to agglomerate to a certain length, which we call as a nucleation process, mm -hmm. to a certain limit, so that it should truncate at the level of nano. That means I do not want to grow it any further to a bulk scale. Rather, it should stop at a nano scale. And these we tune it by using different bottom-up techniques. Like plasma is also one of the way in which we do this. But anyway, this is uh, I'm just telling you because some of the uh, uh, techniques I will also be talking about uh, in terms of some of these species on which we have worked on. Okay, so now. We have introduced the material, we have created the material also, let's assume that using the synthesis technique. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about modulating the properties of these materials. How exactly we can modulate the property? As I said, we can change the shape and size. Okay? Shape I have not talked about though, but as I said, if you change the confinement, of course, based on what kind of confinement you are creating, the shape and size will automatically change. Right? Whether it is 2D material, whether it is 1D material, whether it is 0D material. Accordingly, your shape and size are going to affect the property. Composition can also be affecting the property. You create a quantum dot of cadmium selenide, you create a quantum dot of carbon. Both of them are going to have not exactly identical property, despite they have similar length scale. External effects, magnetic field, pressure, temperature, these can also affect the properties of the material. Like for instance, I think somebody said that they work on piezoelectricity. You know that if you have uh, 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 material like nanomaterial which is of piezoelectric kind, you can squeeze it up and change its electrical property in the similar manner. And then introduce me the difference. This is something which I will be talking about. So I'll just give you an illustration of how say size and shape apparently helps in changing uh, the, <coughs> the optical properties of these nanomaterials. So here I have just taken one example, this is again a borrowed image from one of the, I think I forgot to cite this particular uh, paper where you can see these are all gold based nanoparticles. Okay, here it's a spherical particle, size has been increasing. You see that there is a small shift in their absorbance. Absorbance is actually direct absorbance, resonant absorption going from ground state to the excited state. Okay, then what we do? We increase the size on the basis of aspect ratio. That means I'm just going to create different lengths of nano rods, not just that. I'm also going to, I may eventually also tune the radius <coughs> of these nano rods as well. Okay? So what we are doing is we are increasing from nanosphere going to the nano rods who have different aspect ratio. As I said, aspect ratio is 
length over the radius radius. or you can say the area associated with that particular system. So as you initially see you are increasing the length of the rods, the shift is getting pretty prominent in (coughs) some areas. And these are all again relating to the properties associated with it as well. Here again, since these are optical properties, we know that we are dealing with the band structure Mm -hmm. associated with these properties. And you have been able to tune the absorbance, I mean, on the basis of tuning the energy gap Mm -hmm. between these two systems. Mm -hmm. One thing which I think I do teach my students as well, is if you go back to that confinement effect, okay, you can simply see, forget about the discreteness from N, but energy is always proportional to the size of the particle, right? Size ka square, uh, inversely proportional to 1 over 8. So as you start increasing this size, you will always see the energy is going to decrease. That means it will be blue shifted. But here in this case, we are taking an example of shifting towards the larger size. That means we should see, since A is increasing, E should decrease in this particular manner. So this could be also relating to, uh, you, you may relate to some of the quantum law properties to this mechanism. But as I said, I'll come back to now uh, what I am supposed to talk about in this particular lecture is introducing defects. As I said, I'm interested in defects because defect does do something to the nanomaterials. I'm not sure what exactly it's going to do. Okay? So let's keep our mind open that I don't know what these defects are going to do. I'm just going to introduce them first. And then I will see what properties it's going to change inside the system. So to begin with, I said, okay, uh, there are multiple ways of uh, doing this. One is through um, chemical modification to the surface, which is the first one. I'll call this as surface functionalization. I'm giving an example of green synthesis because I have worked on green synthesis. But you can use any other technique in which you can tune the surface functionalization of the material. In parallel, you can create defects by introducing an interstitial atom in the process. This is also you can briefly do again by the synthesis technique or by ion doping over to the surface. You can even create self-assemblies. That means you create nanoparticles and allow them to assemble together. When they assemble, they create green boundaries. In some cases, they may actually mix together as if like they are one entity. But in some cases, you might even see the green boundary. And then, last but not the least, creation of the defect by using very heavy energy beam. Like, I mean, uh, heavy iron, high energy beam, which we call as heavy iron radiation. Some of these examples I will uh, talk in, um, in, in in detail in coming slides. But defect in solid materials introduce coordinatedly satur- unsaturated sites. When, when I say unsaturated sites, let's say for instance I created a graphene sheet. Okay? It's been coordinated in the center, but if you just go towards the edges, it still has some free dangling bonds. Mm. Right? So if you start uh, conjugating those dangling bonds with oxygen containing functional groups like OH. Mm or even hydrogen. Does it remain like graphene? Answer is no. It is graphene, pristine graphene in the center, but towards the periphery, its properties are going to change because it's been conjugately adding to different entities other than carbon. Right? So in that basis, you should be able to, you should be able to see that these free dangling bonds, if they are not been conjugating with any other entity, may add up to some extra electrons to your system. Okay? Like for instance, if you create a carbon dot, and at the periphery of the carbon dot, you have free electrons. That means now you are creating these electrons to be delocalized over the surface. Now you can, since that electron density is so pretty high, that you can use them as a electron storage devices as well. That means these electrons may now participate in magnetic properties where you only need these unpaired number of electrons to be participating or interacting with the magnetic field. Alright, it also serves as very highly active sites. These highly active sites uh, has an implication just like if I create a catalyst. Okay, you know, uh, most of us do uh, uh, use catalysts for even our body functionings as well, right? Enzymes are also behaving in a similar manner. Now you take a catalyst and have something to be interacting with this. Okay, the reaction will complete because this catalyst is going to promote certain amount of reaction or quicken certain amount of it. Even um, CBD of uh, a carbon nanotube, you need a catalyst to grow the carbon nanotubes over the surface. Right? Now instead of um, having big copper ka catalyst or nickel ka catalyst or uh, nano uh, carbon, uh, iron ka catalyst, what you now do is you miniaturize these to nano size or to even a single atom. What exactly you are doing? You are increasing surface to volume ratio. Right? And because of that, 
the, the amount, although we keep on calling that nano is something which deals with large surface to volume ratio. Now imagine instead of nano, you are at a single atom level. You have infinitely longly increased the uh, uh, surface to volume ratio in, in a given system. And because of that, the reactivity rate enormously increases. Not just that, because of this highly reactive sites, you end up seeing molecular chemisorption, activation, catalysis, even source, which I will be talking surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy appears, spins, qubits, they also start to play a role. Any question up till here? Okay, shall I proceed? Yes, ma'am. I need to check you guys are not sleeping. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll come back to how we are talking about different kinds of defects. So I'll call this a surface functionalization. And by using this, what we are doing here is I'm just using an arsenic. I'm going to create an arsenic nanoparticle. You might question like, Arsenic is a nanoparticle. I'm going to use that nikla hua arsenic to create a nanoparticle. There is a, there is a reason behind it, which I will talk about a little later. And this is exactly the trick why I have been working on this. So, what we do is we take these arsenic and nanoparticles and we functionalize them with certain green reagents. In this case, we use an agent which is called Virginia ciliata. Pashan Bheti Pathar, I mean, plant ka naam suna aap logo ne. It's been usually used to uh, Ayurveda me. It's been used to um, grind stones in your kidney. Okay, pehle kya hota tha ki doctor ke paas log nahi jaate the. Ghar hi log usko se pehle se acha kidney ke saath stone hua hai. Acha aap ye jadi booty lekar ke aap isko khaye. Wo bhi on the basis of like some of the symptoms what the person has been having. But this uh, uh, this plant <coughs> is having actually very high antioxidant activity. And this antioxidant activity itself is that Pashan it can break anything. All right. And then what we did was we used this particular plant and tried creating <coughs> arsenic nanoparticles from an arsenic precursor that is arsenic oxide, trioxide. Okay, it is 2 Okay, we have done that. What did we see? We found not spherical, small, small particles, but we found assembled nano rod like structure. And these structures are extremely large. Okay. So, we, instead of seeing small, small particles, which you can still still see here, can you? Like small particulates have been dispersed there, but they are all being clubbing together, agglomerating together, forming these nanoparticles, and on top also, these are like trying to stick over each other. Up to this, it's not fascinating. Okay? Why it is not fascinating? Okay, but a nanoparticle is 500 nanometer radius, or length is roughly about 700 nanometers. It's absolutely fine. But then it turned out to be that this particle is magnetic. Okay, why it is magnetic? I'll come to that a little later. But for now, we have created something, some sort of a defect into this particular system, assuming that these particles are agglomerating because we are giving them some reactive sites where they should go and sit. And these cannot be happening unless you are actually ending up giving some kind of broken symmetries inside where these particles are going and sitting. Okay, so this is one example. Then in a similar manner, we also created graphene dots in the process of synthesis, graphene quantum dots over graphene. It's like you take a sheet of a paper or a sheet of a paper with chase curve. Right? What you have done? You have graphene code, which was periodic, ruptured. And they actually, the whole large sheet of graphene now starts behaving like a graphene quantum. And this is one way of doing it, which we have done. There are other ways of doing that. Graphene code is a little bit of a little bit of a little bit. These are graphing the different kinds of things. Like I said, defect, you can add it, you can add it. So these are both examples of things. Okay, another example. Grain boundaries, creation of the grain boundaries. Same example, as I said. I have created small, small particles. Okay, these small, small particles tend to agglomerate. Because we are giving them reactive sites at their edges. As soon as they agglomerate, they try to bring small particles over the surface on the basis of certain kind of weak interactions. Structural or morphological defects being introduced. Graphene. In this particular case, this is an STM image of a graphene. You can still see that there is some kind of a dislocation in this particular point. You are seeing that there is a periodic arrangement, but then two of the atoms are being missing from this particular position. So these are like what we, we, we didn't do it intentionally. It happened in the process of synthesis. Assuming that some of the thermodynamical parameters are playing a role to stabilize it by removing one of the atoms in the synthesis process. In a similar manner, this example I have already showed 
that of cadmium selenide, which talks about this is zero dimensional defect. This is, in this case, you are seeing a dislocation at the specific point. So this is one dimensional mm -hmm. line defect. Here in this case also we are seeing line defect. Mm -hmm. Even in some cases you can see two dimensional defects as well. For that I don't have an example right here. Then there is swift heavy ion irradiation. This is, um, uh, this is also one of the very handy work which we ended up doing in which we use swift heavy ion not because mostly what people do is they use the swift heavy ion irradiation to irradiate the nanoparticles itself. Okay. And by doing so, you might see that, okay, some of the nanoparticles get distorted. So because of that, you might be introducing individual nanoparticle defects. Now, what we did, we instead of uh, uh, illuminating the nanoparticle itself, like here, this is one illustration of graphene being excited by Zotepia, drilling holes over the graphene and creating quantum dots. What we did, we used this for heavy and irradiation and irradiated the plant extract through which we are going to create the nanoparticles. Okay, that means what we did, we modulated the <coughs> spherical nanoparticles de rahe, uh, uh, by reduction, we changed those reducing agents itself by tuning the property of uh, the, them by irradiating it with a very high energy. 200 MeV, everything will be distorted. So, jo pehle bade -bade conjugates the in a plant extract now become smaller and because of the smaller, as soon as they go to the periphery, they will remain unstable. And because of unstability, as I said, surface functionalization allows to add more uh, species over the surface. And because of that, the particle morphology changes. Here also, the similar thing happens. That means our theory, relatively worked, in which we called one of them to be AG0, uh, which is unirradiated nanoparticle, and another one was AG irradiated nanoparticle. I don't have a picture of this, maybe I'll show that later, but uh, without irradiation, we were seeing spherical particles, but with irradiation, we started seeing dendrite like assemblies that these particles become a nucleus and then they start growing just like as if they are having wings in the process. Okay, this is another example uh, of uh, defect, but this is important in terms of optical and spin based activity. These are called NV centers in diamonds. How many of you have heard about this? Not many. Okay, uh, quantum information. Ke mein kitne logo ne padha? Okay, quantum information. Mein hum qubits ke Right? I'll stick to a qubit which is 0 and 1. Alright. Here in this case, what we do is we create a nitrogen. That means C. It's a diamond structure. All carbon. What we are doing is we are introducing a nitrogen. And in parallel, we are creating a vacancy in one diamond structure. Okay. This you can do it infinitely long because these are coherent structures. What you do here is you excite it with a green illumination. You are having one ground state and another excited state. And both of them are triplet. Okay, spin is here, spin multiplicity is 1. Spin, uh, spin multiplicity is 2, s plus 1. That means s is 1. So is here, s is 1. And in between, you have a singular state, which is some kind of a metastable state. Now what you do, when you excite something from here to here, you have two possibilities. One, that it will relax back to either of these states. Mm -hmm. Or what it will <coughs> happen is it will try to populate any of these singlet states in the process of non-radiative decays. And during that, this population will reduce. So by tuning the population which you want to populate, you might end up either seeing zero or one state in the illumination. And you can tune the zero and one by applying certain kind of microwave frequency. You know microwave frequencies are of the order of gigahertz. Gigahertz means your uh, spin multiplicity energy. And if you tune this energy, you may even flip the zero to one or one to zero in the process. But this actually was possible only because of the presence of nitrogen vacancy cell. The diamond does not flourish, right? But as soon as you introduce this defect, NV center inside the diamond, it starts flourishing at this green and then multiple labels, one corresponding to 0 ms and another corresponding to 1 plus 2 r. Okay, this is another example in which we talk about magnetic property of our diamagnetic material. Okay, so, it, 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 so what we did, we created in this case, a material which was non-optical before to an optical material. Diamond has a very strong high refractive index. It, it's not going to fluoresce anything. But it's a very strong uh, highly refractive material. But in this process what we are doing is we are converting it into an optically illuminating material by introducing defects. Similarly, we are creating graphene which in itself is a diamagnetic material. That means you apply a field, the moment will face in the opposite direction. Right? But in this case what happens when you start uh, creating different kinds of vacancies inside the system, either substitutional, 
or add atoms or even uh, having free bonds inside the system, you are increasing the charge density in this region. So if you are being able to create a single atom or single spin inside the species, you will be able to create a paramagnetic behavior inside the system. And not just that, it's like as I said, you can, you, you can do it at a single atom level as well, but that single atom spin will start interacting with the field. Right? Earlier it's randomly oriented, but as soon as you apply a field, it will try to align in the direction of the field. Now imagine you have n number of such spins, n number of defects over the graphing. The whole graphene will turn out to be a paramagnetic material. And even if you know that paramagnetic material, as you start cooling it down to a further temperature, there could be a possibility that the same spins start interacting with each other in terms of ferromagnetic interactions as well. How much time are you? Just on time, no? Okay, I think because I still have two minutes, I have not even gone into the reserves. So maybe I'll just uh, uh, <coughs> expedite a little. It's still 1.30? Like, mm -hmm. 1 o'clock. Okay, so I have like half a... Yeah, I'll just wait Okay, so this is another example of uh, enhanced absorption, which is catalysis. I think I'll skip this. This is something which I wanted to highlight and is called uh, creating uh, defects, but for applications in sensors, just like one of my fellow colleagues showed earlier. But here I don't work, I, I did work on PL sensor, but I want to highlight more of uh, source based sensors. So what happens here is, these are uh, uh, silver nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles, and we know these metallic nanoparticles have their local surface plasma on resonance. Mm -hmm. What is this? This is like these particles do have a lot of free electrons over their surface. As soon as you irradiate something externally, that means as a light, which is an electromagnetic field, these electrons start oscillating with the field. And because of that, you generate an oscillating electromagnetic field inside the system. So this oscillating electromagnetic field, if it is being in resonance with the scattering which you are producing over the surface, you might end up seeing an enhanced scattering. Just like it's a resonant scattering which has been happening with the LSPR and that of the Raman scattering as well. And this process is called surface enhanced Raman scattering. Okay, so in this particular case, what we do? We have nanosphere. Okay, we have randomly oriented nanosphere. Not too many grain boundaries. Particles will absorb only at a very local size. Now what you do? Instead of these, we have more number of nanoparticles conjugating together. They are creating some reactive sites because of the interaction between them. And when the particles are being absorbed to those interactive sites or reaction sites, they begin to give more of the Raman scattering inside you. Because Raman scattering itself needs a lot of hot spots. And hot spots are these electron densities has to be extremely high for resonating. And in the similar manner, when you have nano cubes, nano stars, you are creating a lot of edge, right? Edge means more of the defects as compared to anything which is more of a spherical. So that is why, I think this was the example which we had that of a silver when we were uh, using non-irradiated samples. And when we used the same sample and irradiated the plant extract with the swift heavy ion irradiation, we ended up seeing dendritic like assembly. And eventually, as I said, these particles, these spherical particles uh, gave us very weak source enhancement, whereas these dendritic assemblies gave us very high surface enhancement. So I can just give you maybe one example up here what you can see is, in this case, this particular species has been uh, illuminated with uh, the swift heavy ion radiation so that the dendritic assemblies are being formed. And you can see earlier when there was no excitation at that particular, no emission, I mean scattering which you have been able to see, now begins to give this blue curve. So that is because of that you are changing the morphology of the structure by introducing defects into the system. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so this is uh, the multiple approach uh, for determining the defective nanoparticles. I will stick to Raman, for, uh, for example, and PL also I have uh, uh, discussed, but I think since one of my fellow colleague has already discussed about the PL part, I will skip that particular application. But these are two important parameters which I always wanted to like, you know, introduce. One is electron paramagnetic resonance. And another is squid, which is superconducting quantum interference yeah. devices mm -hmm. for having free spins. Like when, when we talk about spin, these <coughs> interactions. So I'll uh, maybe uh, briefly I'll tell what exactly. How many of you are aware of Raman scattering? Okay, most of you. But still, I'll briefly introduce because it is important for my uh, presentation. So what happens here is you have these as um, uh, dipolar materials, like the, I, 
you can just see that there is one it's positive something. side and another negative side. Mm -hmm. Now you are introducing an electric field because of a radiation. Mm -hmm. What will happen as soon as the field of uh, the radiation goes up, the particle also, the dipole also tries to face in the same direction, mm -hmm. right? But electromagnetic field is an oscillating field, mm -hmm. right? So one, once it will, with respect to time, will go up, another instance of time, it will come down. Mm -hmm. In this process, what happens? The spin starts oscillating. I, I mean, the moment associated with the, the dielectric moment associated with your material starts oscillating. And this oscillation will depend on when the particle is being squeezing or when the particle is being expanding. So in this particular process, what you see is an induced dipole moment itself is going to change. Anything? The induced dipole moment itself is going to oscillate with respect to time. Okay, fine, that's very good. We can even calculate that what is the oscillation on the basis of uh, the moment being varying up here. Can you guys see it at the back? Screen the clear picture. Okay. Hey, so uh, there are a lot of mathematics into this, which which uh, clicks into okay, there is a molecule, incident photons, scattering, right? Mm -hmm. If the scattering remains of the same color, we call it relay scattering. Relay the energy scattering. remains the same. But if the energy either increases or decreases in this process, mm -hmm. we consider it to be a Stokes Raman scattering, scattering or we call it either anti Stokes or Stokes scattering. The Stokes and anti Stokes scattering depends on the polarizability of the material, how polar the material is. More the polarity of the material is, larger variation in terms of the Raman scattering you should be able And this is exactly the mathematics which I don't want to go into the detail of it, but I would like to highlight here that when the polarizability becomes time dependent function with respect to the oscillating field, then only you should be able to see the Raman scattering inside the material. So on the basis of this, sorry, on the basis of this, I have yeah, just highlighted the energy label in which you begin from the ground state, you come back to the same ground state. Mm -hmm. This is a relay scattering. As the energy is not changing, you'll see the same color. Mm -hmm. But if the energy either reduces or energy increases, you will begin to see different colors, right? Now in this process, what I do is, I'll just give you one, uh, uh, maybe I'll just skip this for now also. This is how the spectrum looks like. You have the relay scattering at 785 nanometer, and you see one of the Stokes line and another anti-Stokes line here. Mm -hmm. Now you change the excitation. Instead of using this uh, 785 nanometer excitation, you can see the Raman with 532 nanometer or 540 nanometer as well. That means a green laser excitation. Mm -hmm. What you end up seeing is there is a strong relay line excited, mm -hmm. and then you have Stokes and the anti-Stokes line as well. Mm -hmm. So in this whole process, you may be able to predict because what information this is going to give you? This is going to give you an information about these labels, this delta uh, H nu m, which is going to tell you how largely separated these vibrational states are inside the system. And once you know the vibrational state's properties, you will be able to tell what kind of bonds are being present inside the system. And this is exactly what uh, Raman does. Okay, uh, this is quantum picture, I again don't want to, uh, they also talk about the energy difference only, but just the quantum mechanical treatment, since we have limited time, I'll skip this part. But this is exactly what it looks like, and this is what exactly the experiment, uh, even um, this guy Raman did, for which we celebrate uh, National mm -hmm. Science mm -hmm. Day. So what happens here is, this is the blue fluorescence. So I'm using 488 nanometer laser here. Okay, you excite the sample, CCL4, but when it emits, it will be giving you a relay scattering. Remember, relay scattering will be the same image, right? Same color. <coughs> but now what you do is you put a filter so that you don't see this relay scattering. So what is being done here is. In this image, you can see that there has been a filter being put up here, and you see that yellowish line appearing at the back. That means yellow means lambda has increased, mm. right? As mm. compared to the blue, that means blue energy person. has reduced inside this particular case. Okay, so this is all about. I think you Okay, so this is how our spectrometer looks like. This is a range of spectrometer on which we do the source um, experiments. But this is exactly what the spectrometer uh, gives us as, as such a result. Like here, for instance, I have used, uh, what is this molecule, by the way? Benzene. Benzene, benzene right? Benzene. In benzene, how many bonds we can see? We can see carbon, carbon double bond, mm. carbon single bond, mm. carbon hydrogen bond, right? So number of bonds are fairly less inside this particular system. So owing to that, what we can have here is, we can have one, two, three, few vibrations appearing inside the system. But imagine, now graphene, uh, single uh, uh, entity ko hata karke, benzene ko hata karke, aapne pura ek cluster hi bana diya benzene ka. Hmm. Like for instance, aapne ye fullerene molecule bana diya. Fullerene molecule pe kitne CH, kitne vibrations hoon, there will be n number of vibrations which are going to be appearing. So in that particular case, what you will have here is, 
you will see multiple vibrations appearing no matter what kind of dopant you are using inside. So whether it is lanthanum, cerium, gadolinium, yttrium, inside this fullerene molecule will begin to give different kinds of vibrations as well. And it starts becoming a little, um, a little complex in terms of looking uh, the images or the vibrations as well. This is slightly simpler um, a picture of vibration. Why I am calling this? Because this is that of a graphene. Graphene may we have only single layer. The list, the, the vibrational squeezing vibrations are rather more restricted, mm -hmm. and hence because it's constricted in one dimension only. Remember quantum bell problem. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, we mostly what we mostly see here is a D band, a G band, even in some cases two D band, since it is not very defect free uh, mm -hmm. uh, graphene material which we have created. Hence, we ended up seeing only DNA and for some additional bands which I don't want to talk for now. But these are telling us that as we keep changing these compositions of graphene or the synthesis group or the addition of silver nanoparticle in this case, mm -hmm. what happens is you can see your D band eventually increases. And D band is just like as if it is signifying how many defects you have introduced inside the graphene cell. So you can even use the Raman technique to predict what kind of defects or how many number of defects you have rather introduced inside. Source I have briefly talked about. So what I will do is I will show you what are the source cut reserve. But before I go into the source cut reserve, something is which is important, I call that as enhancement factor. Enhancement factor is pehle kya mil raha tha. I will call that as a normal Raman. Aapne usko ek specific treatment diya, which is I call here these defective particles ke saath jinka surface, surface plasma on humne tune kiya. I have merged them together and because of that, now I should see some kind of an enhancement due to the surface. And this is exactly what has been there. You can see that there is a source intensity over normal source divided by that of the, uh, sorry, divided by the intensity associated with the Raman. And at the same time, the concentration of that of a Raman divided by the concentration of that of the source. So usually what we do is source ka experiment hum low concentrations pe karte hai, so that you should be able to predict even at the lower concentration, we have very high intensity. This is what and how exactly this works. But when we talk about the polarizability in local field, these are like two combined uh, techniques which help us in predicting the Raman scattering of uh, cable system. But we are mostly interested in the local field, which is electromagnetic field, hai, because of nanoparticles which we have produced. Okay, I'll just show you the results. I'm, I am not interested in showing you the nanoparticles, but what is been happening here is that when we start changing the particle, like here I have, like maybe I'll just go back a little. Ye image yahan par humne without irradiation ke nanoparticles se banai. Remember those spherical particles which we created. Because of that, I'm getting an enhancement factor of 10 to the power 4. Okay, that means agar mein ek normal spectrum or ek source ke spectrum ko compare karu, mera source ka spectrum 10 to the power 4 times enhanced hai as compared to the normal spectrum. Alright, so you can see, which I didn't see before, the first place is the same concentration. By doing some kind of a processing, I started up seeing that particular signal. Good enough, but now what I do, I irradiated that process of synthesis and because of that I ended up getting those dendrite assemblies, defective particles inside the system, larger particles inside the system. And then, going to that I see, okay, going to that I see these self-assemblies of particles up here. And because of these self assemblies, I begin to see that even the enhancement factor is also increasing one fold, two fold, and so on. So, defects, as I said, are rather good as compared to looking at something which is more precisely ideal in terms of change. Okay, field turn off sensor, I'll skip for now. I'll directly go to the magnetic uh, properties of this particular system. So, let's take away this. This also, okay, yeah, here. <coughs> Since you don't know what electron paramagnetic, are you aware of what is electron paramagnetic resonance is? Okay. Imagine you have spin, EPR, yes, it's EPR. Imagine you have spin up, spin down, okay? So I will consider a spin half system. Spin half means SF ka hamesha half hai. Do MS value possible hai? Plus half? Minus half. What I do here is I consider, let the magnetic moment or the spin associated with the particle be in spin minus half state, ground state. Hmm. What you do now, you apply a field. So field apply a okay? field agar is energy ke barabar hai, what will happen? This spin will go to the excited state. Right? In the process of going to the excited state, you are flipping the spin. Right? Hmm. You are playing with the spin from one polarization to the other polarization. Hmm. But in the same process, you don't know what is the energy difference between those states. Because you have created certain spin, but you don't know what spin energy they actually do belong to. 
और अनदर चेक कुड बी क्या मैंने सही में कोई स्पिन क्रिएट किया है कैसा इलेक्ट्रॉन फ्री इलेक्ट्रॉन क्रिएट किया जिसका हाफ स्पिन एग्जिस्ट कर इनसाइड द मटेरियल ईपीआर इज द बेस्ट टेक्निक टू चेक दैट इवन रेडिकल्स लाइक दोस पीपल हु वर्क ऑन केमिस्ट्री इफ दे वर्क ऑन रेडिकल केमिस्ट्री यू हैव टू यूज ईपीआर एज वन ऑफ द टेक्निक सो व्हाट हैपेंस हियर इज यू टेक दीस स्पिन स्टेट्स बट इन द प्रोसेस व्हेन यू अप्लाई सर्टेन अमाउंट ऑफ फील्ड द एनर्जी स्टेट स्प्लिट्स आपको पता है एनर्जी डिफरेंस कितनी है Now you you use a microwave frequency, just like light. light use optical transition state electrons take it to the another state. You do exactly the same. But here we are not dealing with photon. We we are not dealing with electronic transitions. We are dealing with spin transition. All right. And in spin transition, we take this species only to that particular state by illuminating certain kind of microwave frequency. and the point when the microwave frequency matches with that of the energy of your magnetic field you will see a resonance and this is exactly what you see here you uh, tune the magnetic field because frequency to hum vary nahi karte hain usually hamara source ek hi rehta hai so for a specific source you tune the magnetic field coil ko aap tune kariye and you see that there is one point <coughs> jahan par aapko absorbance dikhega and this will tell what this will tell you the information about g right mu be constant hai but us species ka aapko effective lande g factor pata chal jayega mm. and most of you might know hund's rule aapko kya batata hai lande g factor depends on l s and j right mm. agar l s aur j pata hai aapko quantum information pata chal gayi us system ki mm. that in what quantum state the system is being belonging what the spin is being belonging mm. anyway there is another technique which we call squid magnetometry this is uh, uh, as i said super conducting quantum interference device this also does the same thing except it tells me the collective behavior of multiple moments which are present inside the system okay like for instance maan lijiye aapne ki yahan pe sample produce kiya matlab you have just put a sample inside a squid magnetometric coil squid kya hai i mean uh, uh, when when i say uh, super conducting device hai persistent current flow karti hai right mm -hmm. now agar current in a loop hai beam generate hoga mm -hmm. agree so you have a current in a loop field is being generated mm -hmm. Now in this process, you take that material and you start oscillating like this inside the squid coil. This is exactly what squid does. Okay, यहाँ पर you place your material. These are squid coils, जो कि current को catch करेंगे या current flow करती है उनमें because you are changing the magnetic moment of your material. So it's like जब आप magnetic field को change करोगे तो current distortion में जाएगी. My sample नीचे आएगा तो current distortion. So you are generating an AC current in the process of oscillating the magnet. And अगर छोटा सा कोई भी रेजिस्टेंस डाल दीजिए यू विल गेट द पोटेंशियल अक्रॉस दैट रेजिस्टेंस हाउ मच पोटेंशियल यू हैव जनरेटेड इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ ऑसिलेटिंग दैट पर्टिकुलर मटीरियल सो वॉट यू डूइंग इज इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ ट्यूनिंग और आई मीन क्रिएटिंग द्लक्स ऑफ अ मटीरियल यू एंडेड ऑफ सी हाउ मच फ्लक्स और हाउ मच पैगनेटिक मूवमेंट दिस मटीरियल इज गोइंग टू जनरेट एंड दैट इज एक्जैक्टली वॉट वी यूज For determining whether the material is diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, or antiferromagnetic, you can do the same measurement at different temperatures as well, so that you even know what transitions, at what temperature the transitions are going to happen. Okay, so this is diamagnetic, as you all know. Moment varies inversely. Moment varies again inversely, but here, since paramagnetic and ferromagnetic are temperature-dependent phenomena, we define Curie-Weiss law, in which if your theta comes out to be positive or negative. we consider it to be either anti ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic interaction if theta turns out to be zero we consider <coughs> the material is paramagnetic but whatever we are measuring is the moment versus the variation in terms of the field okay i talked about this earlier but i just wanted to highlight usually spins jo hai surface pe disordered hote like if i consider a spherical particle spins are ordered in different possible directions so agar aap sum karenge to net magnetization hamesha zero aayega right But then you start aligning them in the possible direction of the field. Just after field apply here, mm. then some of the moments will try to align in the direction of it, mm. and hence the magnetic moment will appear. But there is a species which we call as super paramagnetic material. Super paramagnetic material means what? That you are reducing the size of the material in such a small scale that it cannot exist in all multiple domains. 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 It cannot exist in all multiple the size of the particle is reduced such that it becomes a single domain as per being in a critical site and you begin to see that there is a large increase in the magnetization even when you apply a small amount of magnetic field okay now this is uh, one of my result which i wanted to talk about i said 
we created arsenic nanoparticles, right? Mm -hmm. As I said, arsenic is no good for us. People should not work in the lab for uh, in any given purpose. But we did two things. We created nanoparticles from arsenic precursor, mm -hmm. okay? And these particles were large in size, okay? But then I said we check the magnetic property of this particular material, and it turned out to be magnetic in nature. Okay, magnetic in the nature of love, after you apply the ray, magnetization increase mm -hmm. Confirm? So that means we apply a field, this same moments when they are aligning in the direction of the field. It's not love. If I have these particles being running in the space or in water, other my field apply karo, so they should actually sediment in the water. That means up is process ke through other pani may, other aapke paas arsenic hai pehle se, so up pehle unko in magnetic nanoparticles may convert kari. And once they have been converted, you can magnet laga ke purify kar So this was one of the applications of synthesizing arsenic in water itself by creating a diamagnetic arsenic into a ferromagnetic arsenic for magnetic purification purpose. So here I have, uh, yeah. I don't know whether it is visible at the back side or not. This is arsenic nanoparticle in the sediment. I'm sorry? Okay. What you can see here is, you can see at the periphery all the particles are being sedimenting because I am putting a bar magnet towards the edge. That means these particles are so strongly interacting with the external field that they don't want to sediment at the, at the bottom. Rather they have been sedimenting at the periphery in terms of the dispersion. I can even show you, I don't know whether this is being visible, but let's try. You can even see this uh, in, in the video as well that my student who is Moving, you can see that these are the particles of sedimentation at the edge. They are moving with the magnet at the bottom. So wherever you take the magnet, these particles, but the moment, since the moment is extremely weak, these particles are moving slowly. Okay, because they have to overcome the viscosity of the water. They have to overcome the field strength which I am applying. They even have to overcome a lot of other, other properties inside the system. However, this system was good enough to sediment them to certain level. That is why it's, it's, it's still in, in, a, in, a, in a preliminary state where we are trying to use them for uh, water purification. Shall I turn it off? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, how the magnetic tools, I mean diamagnetic tools, super diamagnetic materials we were being uh, able to synthesize. The same materials have also been applied since we've created nanoparticles, we've been even uh, be able to apply it for source sensors for sensing these uh, particles. Then we also introduce, in the similar manner, we also introduce the magnetism in graphene. Okay, as I said, graphene is a diamagnetic material. Okay, if you just take pristine graphene being synthesized through CBD, transfer it, you will not see any kind of magnetism in here. But as soon as you start introducing these defects, whether it is a single atom or some kind of an ad, ad, ad atom being added to the surface, you will begin to see the property because of the addition of that single entity into that. And in this case, this picture I have already talked about, but maybe I think I can explain up here. You can see that there is a small kind of a, uh, like ripple kind of a structure which has been created. And this ripple is telling us that if you have something like this, there is a curvature, right? And because of the curvature, you will always see that the electron density at this part is different from that of the electron density at this part. And they will start interacting with the field differently. In a similar manner, here also what we saw is the material turns out to be EPR active. You see, EPR we have seen one spin for one spin, where we have seen one absorbance, where we have seen six absorbance. Alright? So the six absorbance means that it is having a singlet, not like a singlet state, it has a multiplicity. Right? So spin has to be five half. Multiplicity, two S plus one. S has to be five half. Then only you will be able to see six peaks appearing into the system. And these six spins will only be appearing, 5 half spin cable one species may exist karta hai, jo ki graphene synthesis may use hoti hai, and that is manganese 2 plus. That means we were being able to confirm ki na chahte hue bhi, Hummer's method, I don't know how many of you have been using, but Hummer's method may we use potassium uh, per magnet for oxidizing the graphene property and apparently these manganese ions are getting embedded inside the uh, graphene surface unwantedly, but are being participating in the cell activity. In the similar manner, when we checked the uh, paramagnetic uh, properties of here, so we checked the magnetization versus magnetic field, and again, as you can see, it is behaving like a paramagnetic material, just magnetic like field. how we were been expecting from that of the uh, species. So mostly, we know that there are paramagnetic centers, right? We have also seen that there are phytomolecules, which may also have some manganese and other kind of entities. Even iron might be participating in that. 
but whether there were defects or not. And defects also we confirmed through doing STM that we have some defects in these species while synthesizing them as well. And when we create, when we when we got the values associated with the, uh, the theta value as well as the C value, we ended up seeing negative values inside this. That, that means these pins are not only interacting with the magnetic field, they are also interacting among themselves, which we call as a long range magnetic ordering inside the system. And because of that, we uh, ended up saying that this material is um, uh, not only having uh, species because of phytomolecules or because of something like manganese or spin paramagnetic species, but are also having defects in their species. Okay, with this, I think I'll, I'll conclude for now. Um, I think just on time, right? So, uh, although I could have covered then that uh, PL wala part, but never mind, I think I just skipped that, but yeah. Defects, as I said, we can be able to introduce them by different synthetic approaches, as I have given you two examples, one for graphene, another for arsenic ring system. Uh, these defects are usually good for modulating the properties even under different irradiation. I have given one example of swift heavy and irradiation, but you can do that by laser irradiation as well. Article LIPS is a laser induced breakdown spectroscopy is one of the techniques to introduce uh, heterostructures over uh, different uh, metallic surfaces. I think we are also working on that, but that property I have not highlighted up here since magnetic part was not done on them. But apart from that, as I said, two examples I have taken, magnetic perspective and optical perspective, they both can be modulated by changing the defects inside the system. That means the arrangement of species inside the system. And towards the end, as I have briefly highlighted, these pins are good, right? When they're on a single uh, nanoparticle. So you can use them even for quantum information processing, quantum sensors as well. So I think with this, I would like to just, this is my department. What are the pictures being taken a little long? Thank you so much.